Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service as provided by way of this video, this recording online this morning. We pray that God will bless this time as his word is shared, as we respond to that word in worship and praise, even though we may not be in the assembly of the congregation in, in the sanctuary. Let us begin as we pray. Father, we thank you for this day. This is the day which you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Long ago, Father, you knew that this day would include this type of worship. You knew that this day would include the, uh, the uh, coronavirus and all that that entails for us. Lord, we just thank you that in spite of those things that would distract from our worship and praise today, your presence with us through your word and in our hearts and lives moves us and motivates us to a, a worship of you that cannot be hindered by any of our external circumstances. And so we just pray for your presence with us in each gathering wherever we may be and your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship today is from Psalm Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Before opening song, it's important for us to ask God to forgive us for our sins. We thank him for the promise he gives that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so let us bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, to live, suffer, and die for our sins. We know that we cannot have eternal life without his costly sacrifice. Thank you that he became our sacrificial lamb so that we might have the forgiveness of sins. We believe your word, which tells us that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus the Lord. Forgive us and cleanse us from all our sins and help us in all of our words, thoughts, and deeds to honor you and your sacrifice that was given for us. In the name of Jesus our Lord, Amen. Having prayed for and by the grace of God received his forgiveness, we now turn to him in worship as we continue in the Easter season. Worship Christ, the risen King. A familiar Christmas carol actually is the tune to this song.
Old Testament lesson for today is found in Lamentations, the third chapter. The word Lamentations is, is the title of this book of the Bible because that's what it contains, the laments, the lamentations of the prophet Jeremiah, with Israel having been taken into a land of captivity. But in the midst of his lamenting, he had reason to recognize and to praise God for his faithfulness. Perhaps words that can uh, help us to relate to that very experience today. Jeremiah writes, So I say, my splendor is gone, and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. <coughs> great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. We find the epistle lesson from Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We are, in a sense, in a time of need today. Let us take advantage of this marvelous invitation to approach God's throne of grace with confidence, seeking mercy and grace daily in prayer. And then the gospel text uh, follows the text we had last Sunday from John chapter 20, and we pick up with verse 24. After Jesus had appeared to the disciples um, on the, the day of his resurrection, uh, John continues, Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. How grateful we are that God has not only provided salvation for us, but revealed in his word those things we need to understand in order to have faith in Jesus, God's Son, and in that faith have life. And we'd like to confess our faith today in uh, the words of the Nicene Creed, and uh, those words are before us. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, 
God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen and amen. We want to take a few moments during our service at this time for some announcements. We uh, don't know yet when we can come back to worship at Christ the King, but we will certainly keep everyone informed. Continue to pray your blessing upon these opportunities that are put before us to worship our Lord in uh, our homes, uh, remembering to pray too for one another during this time. And uh, again, a reminder, I am available to serve you Holy Communion any time you'd like to call and we can set up a time for you to meet me at church. Continue to keep in touch with one another, encouraging one another, uh, asking if any need help, especially maybe the elderly or uh, those who may be ill, uh, any special needs uh, that I should know of, please let me know, one of the council members. We're moving along in entering the month of May now, and the first Thursday of May is always the National Day of Prayer. Attached to the email that was sent with the link for this service is a prayer guide that you can use and would encourage us all to pray that on this Thursday, the National Day of Prayer. Also, coming with May is green grass, and there's a sign-up sheet at church for lawn mowing. For those who are uh, able to help out with that, it is very, very much appreciated. And there's other sign-up sheets there also, as we look forward to today when we can come back together. Uh, there are a few things that we'll need some uh, signing up for. And a finally, thank you to those who continue to share your gifts, your offerings with Christ the King, even though an offering plate is not passed. Uh, they can be brought to church or mailed to the address there on the screen. As we continue our service today, before we turn to God's word, the next uh, Easter song is Alleluia, Alleluia.
do you believe that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead? And if so, why do you think so? Yeah, I do think so, but I do have to see to believe. If that many people agreed on the same story, then it must have happened. I, I really don't know. I, I really can't tell right now. I mean, definitely he rose from the dead. He rose for your sins, my sins, and everybody else's sins out here. <laughs> and if he didn't rise again, then he's kind of just a madman, you know? He, everything he said could be a lie. So if someone proved to you without a doubt that Jesus did rise from the dead, how would that change your life personally? Well, if they prove to me in a way that I can understand or I can be convinced, then yes, of course I would believe in that. If there was evidence, I would believe in it because it would definitely change how I view uh, the Bible. Well, if there's actual tangible proof, then yeah, it would make a difference in my belief. In the uh, video clip, we have heard different responses to the question, do you really believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, if that gentleman who was doing the interviewing were on the scene in our gospel text today, we realize he would have received 10 answers that without question affirm the truthfulness of Jesus' resurrection. And then he would have received one answer, basically, I will believe if I can be presented with indisputable proof. We heard a few of the interviewees in that little video clip say that, uh, if there's evidence that I just cannot dispute or deny, uh, I would believe. And that's what one of the disciples said, the one who was absent. We commonly refer to him as Doubting Thomas. He's kind of gotten that nickname. But there is one problem with that nickname. Jesus didn't refer to him or call him a doubter. He referred to him as an unbeliever. It's a little stronger term. But really, it was true. It was accurate, wasn't it? And so, as we've been looking at some of the aspects of Jesus' resurrection, the resurrection hope uh, and, and resurrection peace, we want to today consider the theme resurrection faith. And looking at Thomas as one of the disciples and thinking about our own lives too, of the importance of Resurrection faith. We first of all consider then, under that theme, the refusal of resurrection faith, because Thomas refused to believe. Uh, as we saw last week, Jesus appeared to his disciples on the day of his resurrection, and uh, they were afraid when they saw him, but he spoke words to calm them. Resurrection peace, our theme last Sunday. Peace be with you, he said. And then we read that when they sh he showed the disciples his hands and his side, indisputable marks of his crucifixion, they rejoiced. Because now those very wounds became indisputable marks of his resurrection. He was alive again. They had witnessed his death, and there he was, standing before them, alive. Now, Thomas was not there, we read in our text today. Not with them when Jesus came that day of his resurrection, but uh, the disciples testified to him. We have seen the Lord. The words here, we're saying, is in a tense in the original language that implies that they told him this again and again, over and over. We might say they were insistent on <coughs> telling them, the disciples, that Jesus had risen from the dead. They were insisting on this. But Thomas' response, of course, the famous words, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, he says, I will not believe. Key words here, I will not believe. He doesn't say, I, I cannot believe. He doesn't say, I don't think so. Uh, one of the gentlemen interviewed says, I, I really can't say, I just don't know. Thomas didn't say, well, I'm not really sure about that. He says specifically, I will not believe. He refused. The refusal of resurrection faith. The resurrection faith made itself known in the lives of those ten disciples, but 
Thomas refused it. The refusal of resurrection faith is unbelief. Jesus, when he finally came to Thomas, spoke those words, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and, and so forth. And he says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. That's, again, Jesus' key identifying concern here, that this man was an unbeliever. I think of the many times when Jesus rebuked his disciples for having little faith, small faith. It happened often, I think, during Jesus' ministry. But here, Thomas, the lone disciple, is admonished by Jesus to put aside his unbelief and to have faith. The refusal of resurrection faith is nothing less than unbelief. A few moments ago, we confessed our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Regularly in Sunday morning worship, we have a confession of faith. We identify the reason we are at church or worshiping in our homes at this time. Why are we doing that? It's because of what we believe. And one of the things we believe is that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. We make that a confession. And we believe that because of his resurrection, we can confess faith in the resurrection of the body. That everyone will be raised from the dead. Believers to experience the eternal joys of heaven. Unbelievers to experience God's judgment and punishment in hell. We've seen then the refusal of resurrection faith and the importance of having resurrection faith. The basis of resurrection faith is really a crucial thing to understand too. Thomas demanded reasonable evidence. The other disciples had said, we have seen the Lord and of course, unless I see, unless I can have this reasonable evidence he did not want to go on the testimony of ten men. And other women, too, had reported they had seen him. And actually, two disciples on the road to Emmaus had seen him. No, Thomas wanted reasonable faith. Not just to see <coughs> Jesus and the evidences of his crucifixion, but to feel him, to touch him. He demanded reasonable faith. He's identified in our text as Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus. The word Didymus means twin. And some of the modern translations actually just say that. Thomas, the one who was called the twin. It appears he must have had a twin brother or sister. But you know, Thomas has many twins that are in the world today, spiritually speaking. Twins who will not believe. We need to emphasize will not. They might say they cannot, but the bottom line is they will not. So I have a few quotes here. The first one by Stephen Hawking, a well-respected scientist, but an atheist. He's now passed from this life. But he said, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. There's no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. He believes that anyone who would believe in the resurrection of the dead, including the resurrection of Jesus, believe in a fairy story to help us deal with our fear of the dark. Another uh, unnamed quote, the resurrection is completely absurd and all the other miracles Jesus performed are anecdotal at best. I don't have to acknowledge the historicity of stories of a man rising from the dead <coughs> himself any more than Aesop's fables. These stories are scientifically implausible and historically dubious. Another unnamed person made that statement. And finally, Lawrence Krauss says, 
Isn't it more likely that those who are preaching to convert fabricated a resurrection myth in order to convince those to whom they were preaching of Christ's divinity? And there are many, many more such arguments against the resurrection of Jesus. And interestingly, there have been numerous people who have set out to disprove the resurrection, almost with anger and resentment motivating them. They have set out to disprove the resurrection and in the process, looking at mainly historical evidence now, have become believers, become Christians. But when we think of Thomas' request for reasonable evidence, that's not the basis for resurrection faith. The basis for resurrection faith is God's word. At the close of this chapter, at the close of our text, John states, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not recorded in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that believing you may have life in his name. God has given us his word so that we have a basis for our faith. I stop and think every once in a while, what if I had been born in a country where God's word is really rare, maybe even outlawed so that I couldn't own a Bible? I stop to think about the many Many times in my life I've been exposed to this precious word of God. Oh, how I take that for granted. How blessed we are to have it. But God has given it as his word, preserved the scriptures, and in a country like ours, blessed with abundance of Bibles and Christian literature, we have the privilege of believing that Jesus is God's Son, the Savior of the world, risen from the dead, conquering sin, death, and the power of the devil. God's word is the basis for our faith, and is the basis for our resurrection faith. But think of those who didn't have Bibles, the women who came to the tomb on the first day of Jesus' resurrection. What was the basis for their faith? He is not here, the angel said. He has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of God, Son of Man, must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. Notice the angels don't say, look at that empty tomb and believe. The empty tomb was in front of the women. They had seen it. But what did the angels say? Remember his word to you. Remember what he said. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and all the rest. The basis for their faith that day was not just the eyewitness of an empty tomb, but the words Jesus spoke to them prior to his death and crucifixion. Today we don't have any eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus present with us today. There is much historical evidence, I think even of Paul's words to the Corinthians, <coughs> saying Jesus appeared <coughs> to, to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Paul is highlighting the importance of believing in the resurrection to the church at Corinth, and he lists significant numbers of eyewitnesses. But in spite of that fact, in spite of any other historical evidence, the basis for resurrection faith must always be the word of God. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Jesus said to Thomas that day, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see, and yet believed. 
We have not been able to see the resurrected Christ. We have not been able to talk to any eyewitnesses who were right there. It's uh, too long ago. But we have God's word. We are blessed in our faith because we accept the testimony of Scripture. Years ago, someone made this statement, God said it, I believe it, that settled it. That was a powerful statement, but there's something wrong with it. Properly, we should say, God said it. That settles it, and therefore I believe it. You know, to say God said it, I believe it, there's two things in that statement before it can be settled. God's word and my faith in that word. Truly, when God has said it in his word, that settled the issue, and we need to believe it. The basis for resurrection faith is God's word. And finally, we want to consider the nature of resurrection faith. First of all, for Thomas. Resurrection faith was essential for Thomas. Why do I say that? Remember, Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. And then after eight days, they were together, and Thomas was with them. Jesus seems to have made a special appearance for Thomas' sake. Resurrection faith was essential for this disciple. And we could almost say Jesus perhaps went out of his way to help Thomas come to that faith because Jesus knew that resurrection faith was essential for that man. We read a moment ago from verse 31 of our text, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. God's word was written for that purpose. Jesus came to Thomas that day, not just with his visible proof, what Thomas asked for, but he also came with his word. <clears throat> it was essential for Thomas to believe. Resurrection faith was vital for Thomas as well. So vital that Jesus had mercy on him in his refusal to believe. Jesus was acting in mercy by giving to Thomas what he was asking for. Now, we might say, well, you give someone what they want, they're being spoiled. You're giving them preferential treatment. Well, there's mercy that overshadows all that. The mercy of Jesus in coming to this man. <clears throat> reach here with your finger. <coughs> and see my hands. And reach here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Why did he say that to Thomas? Because resurrection faith was vital. The word vital is often used of those vital signs in our body that uh, are necessary for life. That faith was vital for Thomas. And Jesus emphasized that when he came to him. It admonished him to have faith. Resurrection faith was also peaceful for Thomas. Again, Jesus came, the doors had been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. We saw last Sunday that the first characteristic of resurrection peace is peace with God. <coughs> peace regarding the forgiveness of our sins. We could almost say there's a sense here where Jesus came to make sure Thomas was forgiven of his sin of unbelief. And he brought that message of peace to him. Resurrection faith was personal for Thomas. His response to all this, my Lord and my God. There was the individual who was interviewed who said, I just don't know. He wasn't going to be committal about it at all. Didn't commit himself one way or the other. He wanted to kind of ride the fence. 
Well, resurrection faith can't ride the fence. Thomas made this confession. My Lord and my God. And finally, resurrection faith was powerful for Thomas. The reason I say that is that for Thomas to have faith, as is for each of us, the power of God needs to be at work. The scriptures say that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He didn't muster up that faith. He didn't produce it in his own. These are words spoken to Peter, but words that would apply to Thomas too. This was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. I think we could almost say that when Jesus said, be not unbelieving, but believing them, he was commanding faith in that man's heart, commanding faith to come forth, to be created, because faith comes from the word of God. We believe that our faith comes through the power of the word of God in our hearts and lives. It does not come through reason, through intelligence, through ability in us. It comes by the power of God's word. Resurrection faith was powerful for Thomas. And we want to compare this to resurrection faith in your life in my life today as well. It's essential. The scriptures say, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess, if you believe, it's essential. Because with your heart you believe and are justified, it's with your mouth you confess and are saved. There are those today that have a lot of beliefs about Jesus they believe he was a historical figure. They maybe even believe he was born in Bethlehem in that at the very year that he is claimed to have been born. They believe he was a good teacher. He walked on the face of this earth. They believe lots of things about him. But notice what this these verses say about the essential nature of resurrection faith. Many people who believe all those things about Jesus deny the fact that he rose from the dead. When they hear about the resurrection of Christ, they may say, well, that's just figurative language implying that his, his cause did not die with him. His, his teachings didn't die with him. They rose from the dead to go on and on and on. But notice here, resurrection faith is essential. Resurrection faith is also vital. So vital that Jesus had mercy on you in your need to believe. Mercy on me in my need to have that essential resurrection faith. Notice what Paul says here. I make known to you, brethren, speaking to the Corinthians again, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you... <coughs> Received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. I wonder how many people in my life I can say, would say that to me. I made known to you the gospel. How precious every one of them must have been. How I wish I could remember everyone who did. But Paul is here speaking of the vital nature of having hearing, having heard the gospel. And he goes on to specify then, what is that gospel? I delivered to you as first importance. But I also received that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and then that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So essential is resurrection faith to us, that Paul was very specific in his proclaiming of that message. That, as I mentioned, was in the creed we confessed our faith in. It's vital. It's life-giving. Paul says later in 1 Corinthians 15, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. 
we used to uh, serve a church in North Dakota that was right across the highway from a, a major fishing lake in, in North America. And I often wondered, what did people think when they drove by the church to get to the, the ramp to launch their boats? When they saw people sitting in church on Sundays, they saw the cars in the parking lot. Did they say things like, oh, how pitiful that they're missing out on all the fun by sitting in church? I'm not sure what they thought. But you know, the resurrection of Jesus makes it a vital thing for us to do. It's not a waste of time. It's the expression of our faith in a risen Savior. Resurrection faith is vital. Resurrection faith is peaceful. As I mentioned last Sunday, peace with God is the most important part of resurrection peace. But as Jesus came and spoke those words to the disciples, peace be with you. He spoke that on the day of his resurrection, he spoke it a week later to Thomas. And the message hadn't changed then. And he spoke it again. And he still speaks it. It still hasn't changed. A message of resurrection, peace, comes to us today. Then resurrection faith is personal. And I have these same Verses up here again. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you, with your mouth, if and in your heart, you will be saved. <coughs> Notice these verses make it very clear that this is a personal faith. It's not just... Uh, faith to um, confess in the words of a creed as a part of a service, the rituals we go through. It is a personal faith that must exist personally in our hearts, for it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. The question that was presented by the interviewer in that opening video clip was of significant importance to every one of those people he spoke to. And I'm sure there were probably many others, too, that were not included in that video clip. One of the most important questions that could ever be asked of a person. And of course, the answer, the only one answer that's correct, is yes, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I believe that in all my heart, and I confess it with my mouth before you today is the answer that we should give if that question is posed to us. Resurrection faith is personal. Resurrection faith is also powerful. I mentioned in connection with Thomas that it was powerful in the sense that God created that faith. Even in that unbelieving heart, Jesus commanded faith to come forth. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And that's true for us, too. We believe that the Word of God has the power to create faith. That is why we baptize children, infants. They can't confess with their mouth, but we believe that they can believe in their heart. Because faith, whether it's in an infant or an adult like Thomas, is created by the power of God. It's not our own determination. It's not a matter of our own will, even though our wills are involved. It's the power of God. But resurrection faith is also powerful in another sense. Colossians 3 tells us, Since then you have been raised up with Christ. Now, <clears throat> Paul is writing here to Christians, and he's writing to Christians who are still living on this earth. So when he says, you've been raised up with Christ, he's, he's speaking of the spiritual aspect of resurrection faith. That even though we haven't been uh, died and been raised back to life to live forever in heaven, in this life, today, the believer has resurrection power to live a new life created by 
faith in Christ. Keep seeking the things above, he says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Why? Because you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You've died to the old sinful ways of life and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Keep seeking those things that are above in resurrection power. And he goes on a little later to say, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sin. When I think about sin in my life, I realize that it's a pretty strong thing to overcome. Sin is powerful. But the resurrection gives us power over sin. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sin. Put on the new self who has been renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. The resurrection faith gives us the power to overcome sin in our life and live lives of godliness and holiness before our God and for him. Resurrection faith is powerful. And finally, resurrection faith is substantiating. And what I mean by that is that everything else in life that we experience of God's goodness, of his own miraculous power perhaps at times, finds its basis in the resurrection. John wrote, there for many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. In other words, in the Gospel of John. Many other signs. Jesus performed many miracles while he was on earth. Many of them, John is implying here, didn't even get recorded in his Gospel and maybe none of the other Gospels either. But enough were recorded that we could have faith. But every one of those miracles would really be pointless if Jesus had not risen from the dead. The resurrection faith substantiates every other activity of God in the world and in our lives. All Jesus' other miracles, then and today, find their basis in the resurrection. Why? Because that is the miracle of miracles that, that substantiates the fact that Jesus is God's Son. He is everything He claimed to be as the Savior of mankind. And everything we confess in our confessions of faith about Him is substantiated by the fact that He lives. He's alive today. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. There's one sense where we can't say, <clears throat> you know, uh, someone who may have been healed from cancer can't really say, because he healed me of cancer, I can face tomorrow. Well, that's encouraging, it's a blessing, but really it's only because he lives that we can have the faith and confidence to face every day of our lives until he comes again. Again, Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, our faith, Faith is in vain. Faith in Jesus as born in Bethlehem. Faith in Jesus as one who can heal me. Faith in Jesus as the great physician. All of that is in vain if Christ has not been raised from the dead. Resurrection faith is substantiating. He is alive. He has risen. We think of Thomas, the main character, we might say, of our text today. And we've called him before Doubting Thomas. As I mentioned, Jesus didn't talk to him as Doubting Thomas. He talked to him as Unbelieving Thomas because of his refusal of resurrection faith. And we know that there are people today who are atheists and whatnot who discount that. I've had several quotes in the message earlier, and we could spend an hour researching those who absolutely refuse to believe in Jesus' resurrection. But the most important thing is, is that I'm not 
an unbelieving Thomas, that you're not an unbelieving Thomas. The refusal of resurrection faith is nothing less than an unbelief that, as we have seen, will condemn us to eternal hell. The basis of resurrection faith is not the number of eyewitnesses. For Thomas, he wanted reasonable faith, reasonable uh, reasons to doubt, to stop doubting and believe. He wanted <coughs> reasonable evidence, and many today say the same thing. But we have the word of God has declared to us that Jesus is risen. He is alive. In the nature of resurrection faith, there is many aspects as we have seen. Resurrection faith is essential. It's vital. It brings peace, above all, peace with God. It's personal. It must be our personal witness and testimony. It's powerful. It gives us victory over sin in our daily lives. The ability to live for God as he has given us new life. And resurrection faith gives meaning to every other activity of God in our lives. It gives meaning to that. It substantiates it. May we not today be unbelieving in any way, shape, or form, but believing and trusting in our risen Savior. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and your Holy Spirit who takes that word and applies it to our hearts, that leads us to repentance of sin and faith in our Savior. And we pray that day after day, we would cherish that faith, cherish the opportunity you have given us to believe simply by putting your word into our possession. We have heard that word so many times. May it be not tire of its message, and may we always understand the essential nature of that word which calls us to faith. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next hymn is My Faith is Found, a resting place, not an Easter hymn, but it has much to do with what we have been thinking and meditating upon today.
Father in heaven, we thank you again for the opportunity to come before you and worship today. We thank you for the promise Jesus has given. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We claim that presence, not just as we worship today, but as we go forward to the events that lie ahead in the day before us. We pray especially for those who need the comfort of your presence today, for those who are going through times of sorrow and mourning at the loss of a loved one. We pray for those who are going through difficult circumstances because of health issues. We pray for those who have doubts in their hearts because of the current coronavirus situation as it affects people's lives physically, as it affects people's lives financially, as it affects people's lives emotionally. And all these things, Lord, remind us of those comforting words, I am with you always even to the end of the age. And so we ask that you will hear our prayers as we offer them to you in the name of our Savior who has taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.